So what I decided to do for this audience is to focus on one of the many controversial points in um, my recent reconstruction of Proto-Basque, or the oldest form of the uh, Euskadian language. Um, sorry, I know I was here. Um, just for those of you who don't do much with Basque, um, some of the reasons why um, it's thought to be sort of a difficult language to work on um, um, uh, are, are no longer probably that relevant. I mean, the language is still spoken by very many people, under a million, but still it's quite healthy. Um, it's spoken, as you probably know, in the Basque country. There are at least seven major dialects. Um, some of the big dialects have disappeared in the last hundred or so years, but there's still a lot of diversity. Um, there's also the Aquitanian language, which most people agree is a relation of modern Basque, um, and this language is attested in Latin texts um, dating from about zero to 300 before the Common Era. There are also many place names from antiquity that can be used in the reconstruction. Um, I think some of the medieval data will be discussed in this workshop as well. And um, yes, well, the language is considered an isolate by many, including those who are producing the etymological dictionary that will appear um, this year. Um, there's been a lot of work on Basque historical phonology, the best known being the work by uh, Martinet and Michelena. Um, there's been work on Aquitanian, there's been work on the root structure of Proto-Basque, on the accentual systems starting with the dif different dialects and reconstructing back from there. And there's also been work on the phonetic basis of sound change in the history of the Basque language. And again, you'll hear more about that later in the workshop. Um, and the reason I said that I think the situation has changed um, from, earlier, from early in the 20th century is because um, there are now um, a great deal of lexical resources on the language that are searchable. Um, including the 16-volume Orotariko Euskar Isegia. Um, Asque's 1905-1906 dictionary, which is full of useful cultural information, um, is uh, available electronically. And now we also have collections of Aquitanian data. Um, so, um, uh, and the, the last, actually the last thing on this slide is, um, the um, collected digital version of the cartularies um, compiled around um, 1100, which contain place names and personal names, um, many of which maintain uh, sounds that have been lost in modern Basque. So for the past five or so years, I've been working on reconstructing Proto-Basque, which would be uh, meaning me methodologically using both methods of internal reconstruction and the comparative method where the Aquitanian and dialect data is available. Um, and much of this builds on the work of Michelena, in particular, as you'll see, the Law, the, the debucalization of initial PTK to H plays a central role in my reconstruction. It's something that Michelena thought was going on, but I think I found many more examples of that. Um, so what I'm presenting today is a very small piece of the big puzzle um, relating to um, the status of sibilance in the oldest form of the Basque language. Um, so um, I'm just reviewing here some of the problems with reconstructing isolates. I think most of us are aware of these here, so I'm just going to go quickly. The comparative method, I, I didn't know whether we would all be neogrammarians and using the same method, so these are reviewed here. But um, there is a problem in working on Basque, and that is in identifying inherited words because uh, we know from the, the, the known history of Europe that um, Euskadian has been in contact with at least three branches of Indo-European. 
um, the Celtic languages, uh, the Romance languages beginning in about 200 BC and continuing, right? And then Germanic languages as well. Um, so a big part of the difficult work is separating out potential loans from inherited vocabulary, okay? Um, and of course, it really helps to have a good sense of what the proto-language looked like to start weeding these things out, um, but I think you have to try to be doing both things at the same time. In the etymologies that I offer at the end of the, the book that I published, I've tried to stay away from any term which has um, uh, what looks like a potential cognate in Celtic Romance or Germanic unless I have a good argument why it could not be borrowed. Um, so here, um, you know, words that appear to be native may be loans and seeming loans may be native. Um, so here we have a word that you might see later today or tomorrow, Ibai. Um, uh, that's medieval Basque for river, so it's attested with that um, H in the ultimate syllable. Um, and this is considered by most Basqueologists to be a native term, but um, you know, there's a Celtic form or proto-Celtic form which looks very similar. We can't you know, definitively rule out that it could have been loaned from some Celtic language. Um, we have other words, if you go skip down to the bottom here, like the word bara, um, you know, it looks like the word for bar or barrier in vulgar Latin, um, but I think there are reasons to believe that actually bar is a native Basque root. Um, it occurs in constructions like this term el bar, um, which um, has a, sem you know, a semantic range that's sort of been extended outside of, you know, barring um, with an obstacle. But it, uh, what's important about the word el bar is the initial part, the el, which I believe comes from del, um, which is a proto-Basque root. So um, this just shows you the difficulties inherent in this kind of exercise, especially if it turns out that um, Proto-Basque is related to Proto-Indo-European. That means there are going to be roots that uh, look similar in the two languages. So um, as a background, and some of this is on the handout, um, the Proto-Basque vowel system, it's a five vowel system. On this slide, the diphthongs are in parentheses because uh, in many cases, things that look like diphthongs in modern Basque would have had an H or an N between the two vowels, um, but I'm following Michelena uh, for the most part in, in this five vowel system. And the big differences that come up um, are in the consonant system. So here you see Michelena's 1977 system. Um, there's no P, but there's TK, BDG, and then um, at least uh, 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 two series of affricates and fricatives. That's the focus here, the two fricative sounds. You see that these are also reconstructed in Lacara's work, um, and they also are in the forthcoming Basque Etymological Dictionary. There is a contrast in all of those systems between an apical S-like sound and a laminal S-like sound, which still persists in some modern Basque dialects, um, and that is reconstructed back to the oldest form of the language. I am contesting that. This is my revised consonant inventory on this slide. As you see, there's only a single sibilant. Okay, so the problem here is how do we get from a one sibilant system to a two sibilant system, um, and that's what I'd like to talk about. Um, S summarizing agreement with earlier proposals. Um, everybody, I think, agrees that Proto-Basque had a voice series BDG, sonorants NLR, and H, which was not reconstructed by, for instance, Trask. He did not have an H. Um, that there was a single rhotic in Basque, not two as in the modern language. 
um, and that all consonants except, except for this rhoda could occur in the onset. Um, codas were limited to R, L, N, S, and um, in the coda you could have R, L, N followed by uh, S. The differences here between my proposal and others are I'm uh, arguing that proto Basque had an M, that proto Basque had a P, a voiceless bilabial stop, that proto Basque uh, stops were aspirated. I think you'll hear more about this uh, when Ander Egrotsegi speaks. Um, and the focus today that there was only a single sibilant in proto Basque and that the origin of the contrast between the apical and the laminal sibilant originates from sibilant consonant clusters in the proto-language. Um, so in reconstructing proto-Basque, I have come up with sort of syntagmatic versus paradigmatic properties that aid reconstruction. Syntagmatically, most of these are the same as those used by earlier linguists, such as Michelena, that you could have a bare root um, a root in a compound as first or second element and reduplicated roots. What's different are the paradigmatic properties. Um, I have identified what I think are two um, uh, well-attested prefixes, one which is a nominalizer, ha, often expressed as a in modern Basque without the h, um, a collective prefix, hi, um, the verbal prefix he, which usually, again, is surfacing without the h, um, is a verbalizer, which has been well recognized in uh, Basque historical linguistics, um, as has the participial adjectival suffix. And then the two uh, elements at the bottom, number four and number five on this slide, which are new, is an s, which serves as a nominalizer, uh, suffix and an S prefix, which can produce an SC cluster from a single uh, consonant initial root. Um, and here, this is illustrated with the Proto Basque root bil, which I think is going to appear in the Basque Etymological Dictionary. Um, it's a well recognized root meaning turn around, as in the modern verb ibili, to go or go around. And um, you can see that this root occurs with the ha -a prefix, the a prefix. It occurs uh, as an adjectival or participial form. It occurs in the word, I believe, it occurs in the word bit, which means like to meet or to, to come together. It can also be to round up. Um, and perhaps even in uh, the word seed, sia which is the word for belly button, okay. Um, another small difference between this approach and others is what roots look like. <laughs> so I've identified, yes, monosyllabic roots, but also disyllabic roots. And you see in the first column, the last two entries here are roots that are claimed to begin with SC clusters. Okay, so let us talk about the single sibilant hypothesis. Um, all the previous reconstructions of proto Basque that I'm aware of um, posit, well, using the comparative method, I should say, um, posit a contrast between an apical S and a laminal S that's continued in common Basque. Um, and the motivation for this contrast are minimal and near minimal pairs in the modern language where the two sibilants contrast. So we have words like shu for fire versus su. Um, and as I said, in many modern varieties, the contrast is preserved, okay, that between the apical and the laminal. This contrast also exists in medial position, in intervocalic position, and in final position where the sibilant is affricated, okay? So this is a general property of Basque that a sibilant fricative becomes an affricate in word final position. Okay, so from hatch, you get hatch. Um, and uh, so this is the big stumbling block to reconstructing a single sibilant. <laughs> These two sounds contrast. Nevertheless, I believe there 
five distinct types of arguments for a single sibilant in the proto-language, okay? The first argument here says, well, if you have a vowel, a sonorant, and a sibilant, you never get a contrast between the apical and the laminal in this position, okay? So that's one position with the, where the two sounds do not appear to contrast. Furthermore, there are synchronic uh, alternations between roots or stems that show a sonorant followed by the laminal, Z, where there may or may not be a sonorant present, suggesting a sound change where a rhotic was lost in a rhotic sibilant cluster. I'm going to go through the, the evidence for these. Third, there are root doublets where a Z in one form corresponds to an SC cluster in another. Fourth, there seems to be a distributional asymmetry between the S and the Z sound. The Z sound seems to be at least twice as common in basic vocabulary items. And finally, there appear to be related stop and laminal sibilant initial roots where, well, that capital T represents a historical PTK that's undergone, in most cases, initial debucalization. Okay, I mentioned the initial debucalization at the start as something that Michelena had discussed briefly um, in his work on Basque historical phonology, and so I, I spent a lot of time trying to dig up roots that when they were not in initial position, had initial PTK, in initial position they have H, okay, to support this general sound change of PTK to H in initial position. If we see um, then uh, T, or, you know, PTK um, uh, with Z initial roots, it suggests a possible spustuska to Z, the laminal sound change. Okay, so uh, the first thing I mentioned were inherited monosyllables with vowel uh, sonorant sibilant rhymes where there's no contrast between S and Z in this position. Um, here are some roots that I have reconstructed. You've already seen the second one, that root, bil, okay? Um, uh, and um, what you notice here is that after a sonorant, you find the laminal affricate, not the apical, the TZ form. So the suggestion here is that at the bottom, these all derive from sonorant plus, well, tz, but what that really is is s, right? Because the affrication is a late rule. Um, so to go through the steps, right? The distributional asymmetry suggests a single sibilant, s in the coda. There was a sound change then of coda cluster s laminalization, taking s to a laminal when it's preceded by a consonant in the coda, and then the common bass final affrication, which results in now a contrast between two, uh, two affricates as opposed to the two fricates. Um, just to show how this works, right, we have a form like proto bass cash with S not in a cluster versus the word for alder, which has an S that is in a cluster, okay? And what we get on the surface is two affricates that are distinct because one originates in a cluster and one does not. So then the obvious question one poses is, wait a second, you said that the affricates contrast post-vocalically, so what do we say about words like guts, Right? This is the word for salt and hats or hats, the word for finger. Um, well, in this case, I'm arguing that there was a sonorant there. It's been lost, but we have other arguments that it actually exists.
In the case of the word for salt, gav is a root which means grain, okay, as in a grain of salt. And um, there's a lot of evidence supporting that root in Basque. Um, so I said at the start that there was other evidence for this coda cluster simplification, okay, namely actual um, root, uh, stem variants within the language, okay, so you can see that um, whatever the simplification <coughs> is, it's sort of continued to a point where we can recognize it. So we have uh, the word, for instance, altsper, these are modern Basque terms, the word for badger, which seems to be derived from bear, right, has many forms actually, but one of them, of interest to us, has an R, and one does not have an R. And the one that does not have an R is showing this laminal fricative exactly where we would expect it, right? Because historically the claim is it's laminal because of the preceding, uh, because of the preceding sonar. Okay, the same is true for these forms for alder grove and the word for butter. Okay, so these alternations motivate a prosodically conditioned coda cluster simplification. Notice the simplification is going on in disyllabic or longer forms. Okay, so the actual exceptions, I would say, are words like uh, gats and ats. We don't expect the R to be lost in the monosyllable, um, but it is. In disyllables, this seems like it was a fairly regular process. Okay, so again, just showing how this would work. Um, in the case of the finger paw word in the last column of this little table, you see the reconstruction with a root pa, which means like foot, actually, um, and then a stem, final R, the nominalizer S, Okay, so from this we get things like modern pats, ats, or apach in the form with the ha, historical ha prefix. Okay, the other two words you already saw. Um, with the coda cluster S laminalization process and coda, coda cluster simplification, we're now in a situation where actually we can show there's no evidence for an S versus Z contrast in the coda in Proto-Basque, right? All of the instances of the laminal can be derived from clusters, laminalization in clusters, okay? So we're now left with the question of, well, what is going on in other positions of the word, okay? Um, the, in, in medial position, my claim is that the medial position of these roots are cases which were historically final. They've had suffixes added. So the position we're left to deal with is initial position. The only other position where S and Z could contrast is in the syllable onset. S is well attested <laughs> in the onset, sometimes affricated to th. And you have some examples here of what I think are true uh, continued S from protoforms with S, as in the word for fire or the word for moth. Um, but obviously, you see there were words that begin with Z in the modern language, so what do we say about these? Well, the third argument for a single sibilant is that there are things that look suspiciously like doublets in the language. Okay, um, the, pair, the pair in A on this slide, you have two words, ashtun, which is the common word for heavy. This would be a word that would be on a Swadesh list, okay? It has an, an ST cluster exactly in the position where I would expect a root initial segment or series of segments because a ah looks like the ha prefix that I mentioned. Um, and then you also see there is a word, not very common in modern times, a sun, which means full, loaded, pregnant. So there's an overlap in meaning here between the pregnancy of people and animals. Um, there's a semantic field, which is not uncommon cross-linguistically, right? Heavy, 
meaning pregnant, weighted down, and so on. Um, it very much looks like a set of doublets. Um, and the same is true for the word for uh, skin shell bark, a sun. Okay, I'm comparing this to the ska cluster in asaskal, assuming that there's been sibilant harmony in this word. Sibilant harmony is a common process in Basque. Okay, um, I, there, there are more of these doublets in the languages, uh, in, the, in the language. Um, here's just a few more sets. Um, Ishtin is mud, filth, puddle, pond, effluent. Sildu means to dirty or muddy. Um, so <coughs> the idea here is that S-T-I-L is the historical form of this root. Okay, I spent some time talking about these things, um, that there are doublets. So if we have doublets, we propose then spustuska clusters. What happens to them? S becomes Z in a cluster, and then we have simplification of the cluster the, where the uh, output is just the laminal sibilant. Okay? On the handout that you have, there's a paragraph or so about the um, phonetic basis of this kind of sibilant retraction. Cross-linguistically, there's been quite a bit of work on the phonetics of sibilant retraction in clusters. It is not an uncommon process. I mean, I know we have many uh, uh, people here working on Indo-European languages, so I'm sure you can think of many cases in Indo-European, including things like German, ska, tusha. Okay? That's exactly the kind of sound change I'm talking about here, except that in Basque, all three clusters, ska, spa, ska, became something like um, I mentioned that there are asymmetries in the distribution of the sounds S and, and Z in, in Basque, and um, you know, it's hard to express that by just showing lists of words, but there are many words like zar, zabal, zain, and so on and so forth, which uh, would be uh, considered inherited Basque words. They begin with Z. Um, and I imagine this will be um, a big letter in the Basque Etymological Dictionary, okay, because these are all considered native words. There are many more than, uh, many more beginning with Z than beginning with S. Um, and finally, um, and this is um, a sort of very interesting property, um, there are roots that appear with Z, which then can be related to things that occur on the surface with a PTK that has been debucalized in initial position, so it shows up as H. And I think I, yes, I've included here sort of my favorite word because um, if this etymolo etymology is correct, it's very interesting also from a comparative perspective. So I think the word for 10 in Basque, which is at the top of this list here, amar, uh, has puzzled people. There are many different etymologies of the word for 10. Basque has a, 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 a 20, base 20 counting system, so 10 is sort of only halfway. But um, under my analysis, this word for 10 actually means at the top or top of the count. Um, the question is, wh on what basis do I reconstruct a T for this form? Um, well, I do it on the basis of some other words that don't really look necessarily like they're related to the word 10. But the one that really caught my interest was the fourth entry down here, where you see tamar in a word, shash tamar, which means residue remains waste, flotsam, the thing, things that float on top of the water, the dirty things. Shash in Basque means uh, dirty, and it has it shows up in lots of words. It shows in the word up in the word for broom to clean up, and so on and so forth. But the point here is, uh, literally, this would be mean something like dirt at the top. Okay, so it's an attestation of tamar, which I'm relating to amar, the word for 10, meaning top, 
There are other words like gardama, which means the the seems to mean the milk fat. I mean, it means milk fat in modern Basque, but literally the drops, things at the top. And um, what's interesting here is that there's a very common Basque word, samara, which is the Basque sheepskin coat. It has many other meanings in Basque, including skull cap, um, frontal piece put on an ox, a blacksmith's apron, a smock. It is a piece of clothing or paraphernalia that goes on top of something. Okay, that seems to be the general meaning of the term if we put everything together. So why does it have a Z? It has a Z, I'm saying, because it is historically derived from an ST cluster. So this is the point at which there's some other forms like this that I've given you information on. Um, this is the, the point at which I say, well, um, this is all very interesting, the internal reconstruction of SC clusters in Basque, because with things like Sklesta Ska, we have more material um, for a comparison between this language and this Proto-Basque language and Proto-Indo-European. And for this, because I'm out of time, I can refer you to the handout and to more information in the 2018 book. And thank you all very much for listening.